So um, we're short on time, so I'll go ahead and get started. Um, so I'll be talking about the problem of securing network traffic that's tunneled over kernel-managed TCP and UDP sockets. So essentially, what we're looking at is with all the uh, recent advances in data center and uh, uh, cloud technologies, we have a lot of these kernel-managed TCP and UDP sockets. And we're looking more and more at the problem of finding a uniform way to give privacy, integrity protection, and authentication of the traffic going through these sockets. So on the mailing list, we've talked about two ways of doing this. One is to use TLS and DTLS. So first, I'll go over the pros and cons of that approach. We've also talked about using IPsec and its impact on performance. So I'll talk about the pros and cons of that. Um, I've done some instrumentation of uh, IP second impact on performance using micro benchmarks. So I'll talk about what I found so far, things that need to be fixed, and how to take this forward. So stepping back and looking at the problem we're trying to solve. Um, we have a lot of kernel UDP sockets coming to us from things like VXLAN, GUI, Geneve, and other NVO3 solutions. Um, we also have some recent interest in kernel TCP sockets from things like KCM and RDS TCP. So in all these cases, what we're trying to do is provide AAA, that is authentication, authorization, auditing, and privacy. And we're trying to do this without burning up too much performance. Um, there is some unavoidable cost with crypto, but we want to keep that down to a minimum. And we don't want to be leaking performance everywhere else. So that's one requirement. The other is we are talking about data center and cluster and things like that, which have very strict requirements around failover and HA. So whatever security solution we provide must be a complete security solution without regressing on these other failover and HA features. So to understand how to solve the problem, let's first look at what happens here from a very high level. Um, the, for these kernel sockets, the application data can come from a number of places. It could be coming from a virtual machine for VXLAN, from a database application for things like RDS, or from HTTP2 for KCM. <laughs> In most cases, what happens is that that application data gets encapsulated in another control plane header. So VXLAN adds a VXLAN header with the tenant ID. Um, Geneve adds OBS state. Uh, RDS adds port numbers and other stuff. So after that, when you tunnel the data, and the other side, that control plane header is used to figure out how to demux the packet and, uh, and deliver it to the right service. So the privacy and security concern here is that the traffic that is going out over these kernel sockets, which can traverse long internet paths, is going out in the clear today. It's been OK so far because we haven't really achieved the scale that you can achieve with these things. But that's rapidly changing. Right? And as we go to multi-tenant and cloud environments, there are three things that you need to secure. One is that because you can traverse long internet paths, the intermediate nodes cannot be trusted. So you have to protect the tenant payload. You have to protect your protocol header itself, your Geneve header, or your VXLAN header, or your RDS header, or whatever header. And then you have to protect the control plane, especially if you are using something like RDS, TCP, or KCM. We know that TCP is vulnerable to reset attacks, sequence number attacks, and so on. So you have to protect that plane as well. So let's start with, let's start with the privacy for tenant traffic uh, issue. So what we don't want is attackers in the middle, which are untrusted nodes, to be able to snoop or impersonate the endpoints. And that's not a new problem. We've solved this before for SSH. We use TLS and DTLS at the socket layer. This is great because it gives you per user authentication. It's implemented at the application level, not the kernel. So it's easier to support in multiple environments. But it's hard to map that to a kernel socket model. Right? For one thing. When you talk about things like RDS and KCM, these are using new protocol families. They're using PFRDS and PFKCM, which uh, today's GNU TLS and OpenSSL libraries do not recognize. So you would have to make a lot of changes there. Uh, the other approach that has been discussed is to use TLS on, at the kernel socket layer. Um, the problem is there is no TLS in the kernel. And no one wants to move TLS to the kernel because it's a complex protocol. It has a complex handshake and control plane. So that's not any, it's something anyone is eager to do. What we have discussed is to split TLS to a control plane, which, dis, which negotiates parameters in user space, and the data plane, where it gets encrypted using those parameters. 
right? So this has been the basis of a couple of proposals. One was made by Netflix for an encrypted send file. They found a lot of interesting things, so I'm going to spend a few slides talking about what they found. It's also the basis for the recent KTLS uh, RFC, so it would be good to understand the lessons learned from the Netflix experience. So the Netflix paper, there's a pointer over here to it, basically looks at an open connect appliance. What they were trying to do is they had a web server that gets a client request for an object on disk. It retrieves the object into a local buffer, encrypts it, and sends it out. So the encryption, the obvious way to do it is to do it in the user space. What they were trying to do is avoid the bounce from kernel to user space by trying to do a send file on the file descriptor and send the stuff out on the socket descriptor without ever going into user space. But to do that, the kernel would need to know how to encrypt the data. Right? And what they proposed is the split TLS. They split TLS to the session management in user space and do the encryption in the kernel. Now, one important thing to keep in mind as you read that paper is that their primary scope was just to see if they could accelerate encryption. They were not trying to provide a complete security solution. They were not trying to provide a kernel TLS. So that allowed them to optimize some of the things which they did. Right. So very quickly, they found out that when you split TLS like that, you're doing something to TLS that was not intended by TLS. So TLS thinks that everything is going on the same stream. So once one site figures out the uh, encryption parameters, it sends the CCS, the change cipher suite. <coughs> After that, everything that goes behind that can be encrypted with that CCS information. Right? The assumption being that the other side will first process the CCS and then get all the encrypted data, so everything will be fine. Right? But this has been broken by the split TLS model. And uh, they point out a few other cases, re-keying and a whole number of other cases, where this makes the thing quite complex to do the full-blown TLS in the kernel. Right? And one note in their paper is that when you consider that messages in the TCP stream may arrive out of order, adding TLS for both sending and receiving adds a lot of complexity to the kernel. Right? So making note of that, they paper over all this complexity by saying they only do the sender side of TLS, and, and that's, they're allowed to do that because they only care to see if they've accelerated send file. And in the end, they find that they didn't actually get a big performance improvement. They nail that down for BSD to some, an extra B copy. It's possible that in Linux you won't have that B copy overhead, but the problem <coughs> remains. You have a kernel socket. You need a complete security solution. You cannot just paper over all those asynchronicity issues. You need to be able to handle rekeying. You need to be able to handle all the, uh, the both the receiver side and the sender side. So all that asynchronicity, you cannot just hand wave over it. Right. And in addition to all the things they point out, so the things they point out are primarily where the control plane changes state and the data plane needs to catch up. Right. But when you talk about data center and cluster, you have the opposite problem as well. Your data plane can restart, and your control plane needs to be poked. It needs to be in tandem with that. Right? So examples where this can happen. So we're talking data center, we're talking cloud, we're talking uh, cluster. So you have address and service migration. You have load balancing. For RDS TCP, you could be patching uh, the, the, key, the kernel module, and you want to restart the kernel socket. In most cases, you probably also want to restart the control plane. Uh, there is one case where you can actually very likely want to do this, which is that in all of these cases, what happens is that there's this control plane header which tells you how to demux the packet. You have this VXLAN header or RDS header or whatever, which looks at the packet and says, this is who I should give it to. If that is found to be bad, it means something has been compromised. Very likely, you want to start rekeying. You cannot just say, I'll move on to the next packet. Sometimes you cannot even move on to the next packet for RDS and KCM because your length might be clobbered. So in those cases, the data plane restarts. You need to kick the control plane and restart as well. So we have the opposite asynchronicity as well. Plus, there was the other requirement which I mentioned early on, which is that you need to secure the control plane for TCP. Uh, TCP, we know from routing and from BGP that it is vulnerable to reset attacks, sequence number attacks. Uh, and when you are tunneling things in TCP, as you are with RDS and KCM, you need to protect that as well. And there is another additional twist here, which is that for RDS and for KCM, we are doing this datagram over a stream. And we are promising uh, uh, ordered, guaranteed delivery, and all that good stuff. Right? So what, how that is actually done is the application sends down a datagram. The kernel breaks that up into TCP segments. And it keeps sending those segments until the act numbers coming back tells me that the whole datagram has been received. 
So if someone can inject bad ACK numbers or fake ACK numbers into the stream, this algorithm is blown, right? It, it cannot work. So you do really need to protect the TCP control plane as well. And then there was the HA case I mentioned earlier, which is that the receiver is looking at the RDS header. If that's bad, you need to rekey. So you cannot avoid that. So it's possible that you can take TLS, you can split it up and make all of this work. It's possible that you can do that, solve all the asynchronicity. With enough code, with enough people, you can do anything. But there's no need to do that. IPsec already does this. IPsec already comes with a split control and data plane. The data plane is already in the kernel. The bugs have been shaken out over the years. It's already there. So uh, in the next few slides, I'm going to go over the basic definitions of IPsec. Might be obvious to most people in this room, but just for the normative reference, uh, I'll go over that. And then we'll talk about the IPsec performance footprint. So what is IPsec? IPsec stands for IP security. It is a suite of protocols that allows you to encrypt your data. You do this by adding the ESP header, or you can just do authentication with the auth header. To define IPsec on your traffic, you have to define the security association, which is basically at least a pair of IP address endpoints. In our case, because we're talking about kernel TCP and UDP sockets, you can usually specify more, because you probably know more about the 4-tuple. So you can specify your SA, which is your IPsec flow, more precisely. Uh, the control plane for IPsec is Ike, Internet Key Exchange. Packages like StrongSwan and OpenSwan allow you to specify your keys in a number of ways, pre-shared keys, certificate authority, there's a lot of features. So in our case, we do want to provide privacy. So uh, we, I will be biased towards ESP for the talk, but that's without any loss of generality. The interesting thing about ESP is that it adds an ESP header and a trailer. And the interesting thing in the ESP header is the SPI, the Security Parameter Index. This is a 32-bit number, which uniquely identifies your IPsec flow. And we'll be coming back to this later when I talk about receive side hashing. Um, the other things in the fact sheet for ESP, there is a sequence number to protect against replay attacks. The trailer keeps track of the original protocol. That's just what you would see in the wire when you parse the packet. So IPsec can be used in transport mode or in tunnel mode. Which mode you use defines how much you encrypt. So if you were using IPsec in transport mode, you would apply the transform on the TCP or UDP header and the data. You would not change the IP header, so you would not change the routing. In tunnel mode, you take your whole IP packet, you encapsulate it inside another IP packet, and the inner packet is uh, transformed. So this is used in the VPN case where the outer IP packet contains the VPN source and header. So for data center and for cluster, our routing information usually comes to us from a cloud controller or a cluster topology. So usually transport mode is sufficient, but tunnel mode is there if you want it. So IPsec is fully featured, and it has all the things we want, the data plane in the kernel, the control plane in user space, lots of ways to specify keys, and so on. The only thing we haven't talked about is the performance profile. So for the rest of the talk, I will be going over the performance profile of IPsec as we have found from initial microbenchmarks. This is still an ongoing process. Uh, because of the lack of time, I'll mostly talk about why we're doing the things we're doing, the actual bots we'll discuss tomorrow <coughs> in the IPsec discussion. So what I started off with was a microbenchmark using iperf single stream. I looked at the throughput and the CPU utilization. I used two X54s with a 10G line in between. So for the initial exploration, I found that the features that most impact performance are segmentation offload and receive offload. So I tried modifying those parameters for both clear traffic and for encrypted traffic. And IPsec itself, I tried three different cases. One is null encryption. That means you don't do any crypto. You just add the ESP header and trailer. This just tells you the theoretical maximum performance you can get. Then I try two types of encryption. One is GCM 256, which is what is recommended by NIST. The 256 is the key size. And I also tried CCM 128, which is the one that used to be recommended by NIST. So the difference between GCM and CCM is that GCM is parallelizable in hardware, so it tends to be a little bit faster than so in the next slide, I'll actually show the histogram with the results. But what you will see there is seven cases, four for clear traffic and three for IPsec. For clear traffic, I tried hardware, everything with a default, so it's hardware offloads. Then I tried it with software offloads. Then I tried just GRO and just GSO, just to see what the effect of losing offload is on clear traffic. And then I tried the three IPsec cases, null encryption, which should be just like the clear traffic with hardware defaults. 
and then the crypto cases. So this is what you see. The percent numbers you see on top are the peak CPU utilization. <coughs> So the leftmost line is with all hardware offload. So this is a 10G line. So that's getting as close to line speed as you can get. It's nine point something, right? So that's good. Then when you go, when you take away the hardware offload, your CPU utilization grows, goes up, you're still getting pretty good throughput. But then when I remove the offloads, it drops, even for clear traffic for the green lines, right? And the CPU utilization grows up. So that tells you that offload has a lot to do with performance, even for clear traffic. Now, when you, when you apply IPsec, what's happening is that the IPsec transform needs to be applied after segmentation because it works on the TCP header, right? So today's stack <coughs> automatically disables uh, uh, offloads when, you, uh, when it sees IPsec on the socket. So that is one reason why the first red line is so far from the first green line. Plus, there's another reason. You would expect that the ESP null is pretty close to clear traffic without offloads. There is still a big difference, and that difference I found was because you also lose some of the benefits of RSS and RFS, and even that can be mitigated. So I'll talk about that as well. And the last two cases just tells you the penalty of paying for crypto with respect to ESP now. Did you say single stream? So what I found, and that's the third bullet here. Basically, I had to manually place the IPER process on one CPU and the IRQs on another CPU. Otherwise, I was not getting the same thing as clear traffic with. With, uh, so the, the encryption was it done in hardware or in software? The I was using GCM two fifty six, which my understanding is it goes through AES and I. So I'm assuming it went through hardware. I went through the priority. So, um, so to summarize what I just said in the previous slide, right? So offload is very important to performance, and when you apply IPsec, we are disabling offload today because we're saying, oh, I need the TCP header first. Uh, the other thing was uh, the thing with IPER placement and IRQ balancing, right? I was using, losing some of the RSS, RFS benefits. And there was also, this was discussed on the list, there are some things in the IPsec code which can be done better. There was an SKB cow data and a few other things. So some of those things were cleaned up for the uh, numbers I'll be showing as well. There's still work to be done there. So the first thing was, uh, at least for GSO and GRO, these are software implementations. So you could potentially extend them to do IPsec at the right point after taking care of the offload, right? So that would be do the IPsec after GSO segmentation and do the decrypt before you do GRO coalesce. So it turned out Stefan Classet was also looking at the same thing for the GRO side, so we put our work together. And when we tried to combine thing, this is what you get for the same setup, right? The software performance has gone up significantly. We've gone from two gigabits per second to eight. Right? This is almost close to what you are getting with clear traffic with uh, software offloads. The CPU utilization has peaked, and that's not good. Right? And this, is, this hurts even more when you go to GCM256, because I was not able to go more than 4.5 gigabits per second, <coughs> right? and it's 100% CPU. So that tells me that this is time to start looking at hardware offloads, because this is the best you can do in software. There might still be things you could fix, but I think that to get the real 10 gig, you would have to go to hardware offloads. Right? And uh, when I talked to some Intel people, they told me that the 10G Nix, Niantic, Twinville, Sageville, already supports IPsec offload. And it looks like Microsoft has the DDIs and DKIs for this. But the Linux stack does not. Uh, this is something I'm hoping <coughs> to develop this week. Uh, I was talking to a few more Intel people today. It might not be, uh, there might be more to this than meets the eye. So. One of the things we need to explore is how to do hardware offload. So the other thing was the flow hashing on the receive side. So today's RSS and RFS classifies things based on flows that are defined on IP addresses and port numbers, TCP and UDP port numbers. So when IPsec was applied, it <coughs> assumes that the port number has been encrypted and does not do a very good job of doing the flow classification. Right, so that's why I was losing the benefit of that. So what I instead had to do, I had to manually put the IRQ in one place and the IPERF process in another to get the best possible performance. <coughs> but it doesn't have to be this way. Right? There is the SPI, which identifies the IPsec flow, which is, it is a 32-bit number. And when you're doing ESP, it conveniently falls in the same place as the TCP and UDP port numbers. So even the hardware should not need too much change to, to use that. Right? The question was raised on the list, is it is it architecturally correct to do that? And the answer is yes, because the SA minimally identifies the IP endpoint addresses, so it's not, it doesn't make things worse. 
It does make things better for our case because we can make this flow pretty specific based on the port numbers. <laughs> right? Besides, the, the, the final argument is we're already doing this in proto ports offset to do on the TX path. So we just need to do this uniformly everywhere. Right? And um, I think it should also be fairly easy to get the drivers to process this and run a hash based on the ESP. So to leave time for questions, I'll just stop here and talk about what's going on right now. One is to look at the hardware offload of IPsec. We are, I'm hoping this will reduce the CPU utilization. Uh, the Microsoft API looks like they're pushing the security association to the driver and keeping that updated as the FIB changes. Uh, I don't know if how well that worked and what, what, how, what, what my intel might have more to say on this. Then we need better receive side flow hashing in hardware and software. The flow hash can come to us from the NIC. There's also other things. We, uh, there's an FDIR hash. There are FDIR misses that are going on, so I don't know if we can use the FDIR better, so that's another thing to explore. Uh, we also need to work on the software <coughs> paths itself. Even the eight gigabits per second can, might get better at that point. And then move on to more benchmarks, macro benchmarks, try real database workloads, uh, try this from a VM, try more difficult things than just a simple type of test. So, questions, comments? Sounds like you're saying TLS, PTLS is a dead, right? I, I think I, that I you could, people, I don't. Other people think about that? I, I hope they will respond, but in my opinion, if you try to fix that to deal with all the cases of asynchronicity, you'll just end up inventing a third mode in IPsec, right? Because you would have to solve all the things IPsec shook out over the years. So you can do it, but I, I think we might as well just clean up IPsec at that point. I have uh, two questions. Uh, the first one regarding the hash function you previously illustrated on uh, one of the previous slides. You mentioned that you hash also by ports. Now, uh, I, want to, I would like to know how, how do you deal with IP fragmentation for UDP, in, in which case you do not have the port number on the packet? That is, that is something I was actually asking someone yesterday. I don't know how the RSS, RFS code today works on that. I think that if you have IP fragmentation, they assume you're already going in the slow path, so you lose RSS, RFS too bad. Usually you don't have fragmentation, right? When you start fragmenting, it's, it's a badly designed network. I think it doesn't work anyway. So, I think that all of that is a fast path thing. And well, for our for hardware RSS, for sure, the Intel driver disables the hashing by port. It only hashes by IP address. That's right. for sure. For just going to the the kernel code. Um, second question: uh, You mentioned how you are uh, offloading using the the NICs. And you said you talked with Intel. Did you also consider using the Coletta Creek uh, hardware offload the uh, chip from Intel, or, or did you know? Are you done with the Q80s? Pardon? I didn't quite catch what chip you mentioned. The Q80 chip. Intel has two chips. It started with K Creek, and now it replaced it with Coletta Creek, and it has an I have hardware not offloading capabilities of up to they claim uh, a, a 80. G, uh, G I have yet. I would certainly be interested in trying that. I was not aware of That's this. So if you, the end, right? You're yeah. bounce, bounce through the right, through the PCI bus again. It's a separate. It's a separate chip. So okay. you can say, you know, I, I need this stream to be encrypted, but it goes through the bus back to the host. Goes to the bus to the NIC again. Okay. So I think Jesse Brandenburg was mentioning yeah. this to me this morning. Yeah, so. this, this is the one talking about the, the QAT. Yeah, okay. yeah, something I have to look into. But that's another you know ongoing work thing. This is hardly done here, so. So on the hashing, so you're mostly focusing on the, the host or, or the, you know, the next side of things, but there's also the, the network in the middle, so you know, switches are doing ECM. Yes, and, and that, that's, that's why I said the ESP, the SPI conveniently falls in the right place, so it should be easy for them to modify themselves too. That's a lot easier than the offload part. That's what Intel told me. Right? Yeah, but I guess, yeah, the only thing is it does, it does require modification. Right. Yeah. Talk, it's talking to vendors and saying, don't get scared if you see IPsec like proto <laughs> right. 50, yeah. you know? <laughs> I guess one other possibility is yeah, for NAT traversal, yes, people would stick on each of the headers or something like that. You could yeah. do the, the same tunnel. Right? You could use the tunnel mode too for that if you if that's what that's the concern. Um, did you actually look at the NAT traversal at all when you have the IP sec in a separate unit? No, I've just started with micro benchmarks and this was actually quite to start with two gigabits per second was quite depressing. <laughs> so <laughs> we have to get there. <laughs> uh, 
IPsec already has that traversal for UDP. Yeah. And this is basically a, a host to host dynamic, right? I mean, in this case, I'm, that's why I'm working with transport mode. Uh, like, uh, IPsec for the VPN. Forwarding path. Yeah. Then this DSO and that. Yeah, so Stefan will be, I don't know if Stefan's here, but Stefan's going to, was looking at that quite in, quite in a lot of detail. So he'll talk about that tomorrow in his IPsec talk. But the numbers were similar. He was also capping off at four gigabits per second. So, thanks very much.